Here we are again at uh, GPS. So God's prophetic surprise, we're doing the book of Revelation and uh, we're happy. If you're regular, please, uh, we're thrilled to have you again. And uh, if you haven't emailed this, uh, let me read it again. Our email address, which is uh, gps at llbn.tv. So we get some, we're beginning to get some. And if you're one who has written to us, thank you very much. And we'll try to answer uh, questions that come our way. I know I got one last week I need to pass on to you. So uh, anyway, thank you for communicating with us. Every part of the show, I or usually John will ask you to be our reality check and uh, where does this fit? <laughs> but let me, let me do that myself this time. Check As it. we are doing this show today, your grandfather died. Mm -hmm. And you are flying out tomorrow. Yep. to go to the funeral in the Dominican. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of us because we sent you. Last year. To see him before he died. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very meaningful for our church board. We were happy to do that. We love you, but no one, no one should not have that chance, you know, right. to see him before too late. With all that we've talked about, you know, we've had two shows uh, the last couple of weeks about, about Revelation and the scroll and unveiling of the scroll, the opening of the scroll. Anything, <clears throat> mean anything to you as you get on a plane and just say, that generation is now gone for your mm -hmm. family, right? Yep. Yeah, say something about that. Well, I think, I think it's interesting <clears throat> when I think about death in general and I think about what I live for. And you know, I was a clinical chaplain and so I'm so fascinated by the grieving process and by even the dying process because there's a way to die well and there's a way to um, kind of effulge goodness even in the process of letting go of what so many people value, you know, which is life. And I think for me, when I think about it, I think about, you know, when we read Revelation, it's a love story in a lot of senses. And it's a way of living and challenging us to live differently that we can't always understand. Mm -hmm. And I think my grandpa hasn't been able to really speak in a year. Mm -hmm. And so he hasn't been able to verbally express how he feels about things, but you can, you can see his emotions go, you know, through interpretation of his actions. So you kind of know inherently what he's saying to you, even though he can't speak. And so I think when I think about those parallels, you know, for example, when I went to see him, he hasn't said much, but he like muttered something that sounded like Sarita and then just started crying. And I knew at that moment, like, he knows exactly who I am. And he knows exactly, you know, like that I'm here at this moment and it's beautiful. And then, there are other moments when I'll be saying something jokingly to my dad or to one of the nurses or something, and he'll just find it hysterical, and he just starts, like, whole body laughing. Like, and, but he can't say anything back. So it's all you're hoping he gets what you're saying, and you're hoping that he's experiencing it. And I think with Revelation, I, I, whenever I read it, I'm hoping I get the pieces, right? I may not understand everything. I may not be able to communicate with it. It may not be like verbal words that make sense to me, but I think I that, that experience of like going through it and like every so often something will take you aback and you'll experience that emotion with it, even if it's not. Someday he'll be able to talk again, but right now it's yeah. compromised. Yeah. Now let me press you one more, one more step. And I mean this in the, in the best sense of this. Mm -hmm. Often in our world and on this show, you will be the champion for today. Right. Now, not just someday, but now. Right. But that someday just ended with him, and mm -hmm. you're with him ended. Right. Uh, so that's the other side. We say there will be another time right. with him. How does that balance this weekend? Um, well, I mean, I think that's where hope comes in. So that's there for you. We, we balance yeah. both. We balance both, and I think for me, I just, I, I've always, because <laughs> I've always tried to live mostly in the present, because my world, as you guys know, has been all over the place, whether it be in my own personal bubble or with my family or with just basic living is kind of complicated to see what it's, anything it's, in the future it's, it's is. It's good, it's still good. And so I'm very much into live in the moment, yeah, have hope for the future, absolutely, and don't let your past dictate everything, but let that be your compass. And so learn and grow. And so for me, yeah, absolutely. I think that there is a hope in it. And I think when, when I think about my grandpa, when I think about, you know, my grandma and everyone in my family that has passed away or that I haven't even met that passed away, I think about the stories that we'll share eventually, or at least this, like taking their story that did happen and figure out how to live that out so it doesn't die. So for me, it's more about keeping stories alive and keeping 
that part celebration alive as opposed to letting everything just go. And so there's not just an end One point. One time you said here somewhere, you know, gold, streets of gold and mansions aren't no. what really wind you up. I don't but just being with your grandfather and grandmother oh, and absolutely. telling stories again and being with them and they're young and alive, that, yeah. does, that is good. Yeah. Now we're going to the Philippines in six weeks and we're going to go help you with your foundation. Mm -hmm. We'll preach at night and during the day we're going to go to your Propel. Project Propel. And, and put, put gardens on walls or whatever it mm -hmm. is you're going to have us do. So somewhere there's a balance. I mean, we, we do the walls and we do the food and we find water for people and we help girls and need mm -hmm. to go to school. And at night we go and give people hope they can see their right. families. Right, but someday. I think that's where the twofold is, is. And I think that's where, you know, that's why in some senses when we work together, it's a good balance because sometimes I get totally focused on all the practical and I just need like, I want to give people food. Like, you know, I, I'll, that's how I'm going to give and them hope. I want hope. people to nail down heaven and be <laughs> right. together forever. Right. And I want to see my dad again. Right. I want to see him. And that's, and that's a good balance because those are two things that are very important to people. And I think Revelation feeds mm -hmm. into both because I think how do you own the story of Revelation when it's a lot of it's interpretive? You know, a lot of it isn't like, here's the answer, circle it, you're good to go. And that's where I think we get distracted sometimes. So yeah, I think the hope that we're able to give people through the book of Revelation is a beautiful thing. But I don't want it to stop there. I don't want every yeah. conversation only to be like, oh, you're going to live well now because your grandpa died and you want to see him again, so don't screw this up. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> that has very little to do with it. I want to live well because I want my grandfather and everyone else's legacy to carry on and for their story to be part of my story. Tell us, and tell us how it felt on the other end. I'd like to hear. On what other end? When we do the next show. Okay. Uh, you know, you will have traveled there and come mm -hmm. back by then. And, and what does it feel like to have that generation gone and your memories and your feelings about it? Mm -hmm. And what is Revelation, you know, what did it speak? And, and, and we have to find that balance, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm hoping our trip to the Philippines will be both of those things, mm -hmm. you know. We will do very real work to make people have a kingdom of God better right here and now. Mm -hmm. And there's also, you're going to see your family again someday. Mm -hmm. Revelation, I hope, resonates with both of it. We promised John we would uh, come back to the whole idea. Please find Revelation 5. And, uh, and we're going to come back to the story of the scroll. And we have said now in two, two shows that the unveiling or the opening of the scroll really began when Jesus was enthroned at his ascension, A.D. 31, whatever year that was. And that the Holy Spirit was poured out and the Holy Spirit was a sign that Christ had now had his kingdom inaugurated. He's at the right hand of God and all of that. But you said there were more lines of evidence and support. So mm -hmm. we want to take get a good share of this particular show and say, give it all to us. And I, uh, I would, I would su support what Sarah said in the sense, not everybody is going to come to the book of Revelation and say, wow, this is what I needed. This puts it all together. The book of Revelation is one of 66 books in the Bible. Uh, each one of them is probably the favorite for somebody. And uh, well, First Chronicles might be a bit tough. Although I think, uh, I think my daughter Kimberly does. Oh, First Chronicles is awesome. And I said, Wow, it's the first time I heard that. Yeah, <laughs> our other associate, Pastor yeah. Tony, is going to do Leviticus this yeah. year. Uh -huh. Okay, we're going to do Leviticus. That's another <laughs> tough one. See, but but every biblical book has a, a message about God that's critical uh, for somebody. You see, and so. Uh, a lot of people come to the Jesus story through the book of Revelation. That's their favorite place mm. to get in on it. So, so rightly interpreting, rightly understanding that book is very important to make sure that they get the story right and, mm -hmm. and they get what they need to, uh, to cope with life and, and be prepared for what's coming. So the question is, when did Jesus approach the throne? When did he take the scroll? What's the foundation for all of this? And our, our hypothesis, based on Revelation 3.21, is that uh, taking the scroll is part of his enthronement after the cross and the resurrection, uh, before the 2,000 years mm -hmm. of Christian history. Um, another piece of evidence is that the book of Revelation is structured like a chiasm. There's mm -hmm. seven visions the first one is strongly parallel to the last. The second one is parallel to the next to the last. Now let me just show you how this works. Let's go to Revelation 19. And Revelation 19 is extremely parallel 
to Revelation 4 and 5. So this is the other end of the book, the chiasm, uh, where they go side by side. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, remember them? Yes. Fell down and worshiped God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. So clearly chapter 19 is a counterpart of chapters four and five. You got the throne, you got the 24 elders, you got the four living creatures, you got worship going on. But here's the interesting thing. Why are they worshiping in chapter 19? Because end time Babylon has been defeated. It's referenced here mm -hmm. in verse two. Uh, he has judged the great prostitute. It doesn't say Babylon here, but uh, the great prostitute is Babylon in chapter sure. 17, 18. So there's an end time power that we'll come to someday in, in our uh, meandering through the book of Revelation. This Babylon has come to an end, the great threat to God's people, and they're worshiping, praising the same characters as chapter 5 are praising, but they're praising because Babylon has been overthrown. That's an end time concept. Hmm. So chapter 19 is at the very end of history. No question. Everybody, I think, agrees with that. Why do the same characters get all excited in chapter 5? Cross. Particularly the cross, but in chapter 4 or 11, creation, creation. even. Right. See? Right. So creation and the cross is the source of worship. In, uh, in chapter 5, the fall of Babylon is the source of worship in chapter 19. So you see, the second half of the book of Revelation focuses almost completely on end time events. <laughs> the first half of the book does these sequences, it starts with the cross and goes to the second coming, whereas the second half of the book just focuses on the final events of verse history. Many people have tried to see the seals and the trumpets as just more end time stuff, but I think that goes against what's actually happening in the text. But does that mean, I mean, for me, the way I interpreted it, it was not that deep at all. It was really just the fact that they're still worshiping. Mm -hmm. Like throughout the process, like it's, a, it's yeah. a true factor that they're constantly celebrating with God the stepping stones as opposed to, yeah, we talk about it over here and we, we pinpoint these two things over here. But no, really, it is happening throughout the book of Revelation, meaning throughout time, mm -hmm. they're still worshiping. So, But it still matters, I think, why that they're worshiping. Mm -hmm. If you're worshiping God because he created... That creation is not part of your experience. Right. But it is a fact that matters. Hey, if God created everything, then everything here matters. Mm -hmm. So it's important. If you're worshiping God for creation, it, it has an important context. If you're worshiping him because of the cross, that's a different mm -hmm. reason to worship. That's something he did specifically for you. Mm -hmm. That's part of your story in a special way. So uh, worshiping... You know, praising God for Babylon's fall is going to make sense if Babylon is stomping on you right. one day. And then uh, when, uh, when God brings that to an end, you can say, wow, you rescued me. Just when I thought everything was lost, you, know, you mm -hmm. rescued me. Praise God. And that's what hallelujah means, right. Hebrew for praise God. So uh, as we go through the book, from beginning to end, you move from the New Testament story to the end time story. Hmm. And uh, that's, that's a piece of this. You can see that again in the five horsemen of Revelation. Did you know there are five horsemen? Four of them are in chapter six. Oh, 19. Yeah. The other one in chapter 19. Um, let's go to the, a plus. <laughs> since we're in chapter 19, let's go to verse 12. It says, his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. 
Okay, most of you probably don't know what that means. That's a modern translation. We have no idea what it means, but <laughs> it's just the crowns is what it's saying. But the Greek word for crown here is diadema, mm -hmm. which is a royal crown. Okay. It's a crown. It symbolizes this person has the authority to rule. Okay? But let's go back to chapter 6, and we'll see a crowned rider on a horse. In Revelation 6, verse 2, it says, I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. The word crown here is not the same Greek word. Hmm. And that's why some of the translation used the diadem to indicate, you know, the same translation here in chapter 6 says crown, and chapter 19 it's diadem. That's good because it signals the reader to something different going on. The crown here is like the Olympic gold medal. Hmm. It's the laurel wreath that people put on the head when they won the, the gold medal at the Olympics. So uh, this is a victory crown. It's the crown you get when you've uh, conquered something. And it doesn't have to be royal. You don't have to be a prince or a king or something like that to get this crown. You just have to be you have to prove an yourself. athlete. You got to prove yourself. Yeah, qualify. Chapter 19, though, is the royal crown. Jesus wears the royal crown hmm. at the second coming. But at the beginning, he wears the victory crown. That's the one he got in chapter 5. Interesting. For, for dying on the cross, he gained the victory. He has overcome. Same word. He has overcome. So the victory crown means that Jesus has done everything that we need, but he does not yet rule the earth in the sense that everybody recognizes it. Interesting. Everybody supports him. So uh, little details. But uh, in the book of Revelation, above all other places, you've got to be attentive to the details or you miss so much of what's going on. Now, uh, what difference does that make in today's world? I think, uh, as I mentioned the previous one, first of all, our mission on this world is helping people understand that they have no need to be afraid of God. Hmm. They have no need to be afraid of God ruling their lives because God wants the best that's there for you. So people on this earth haven't yet embraced the rule of God. You said you didn't like the idea of the reign of God. Yeah. But the, the whole idea of reign and the concept of Lord means simply that you trust that somebody else has knowledge that you don't have that's for your good. So it's not a dominance. It's not a, I could crush you like a bug. You know? <laughs> that's not what Lord means uh, when, when God takes on or when Jesus takes on the term. It means that he has earned the right to tell you what to do because it's what you would want to do if you knew better. Right. Just like parents. They sometimes tell you what to do, and they sometimes at least know better. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. I have to link to, mm -hmm. to scroll, just so I don't get too far away from that. Mm -hmm. You've been going through this crown motif now. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I've lost the connection to the scroll. OK. He takes the scroll. In chapter 5. Yes. He starts breaking the seals. Okay. These are not revealing the scroll because a scroll cannot be seen till all seven seals are broken. But the breaking of the seals trigger events on earth that take us from AD 31 until the end. With the first breaking, you see Jesus as the victor. Here in, in chapter yeah, six. Yeah, in chapter six. In chapter 19, the rider on the white horse now has the royal crown. He now has... So uh, the scroll proves that he's the victor. The scroll proves that... Yeah. So that's like the thing proving... Not everybody says this horse and rider or Christ. In chapter six. Right. Well, well, we'll come to that when we get to chapter six. Are you building a key? Does it necessary to interpret that as Christ to make the point that you're making? It helps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we're going to put Jesus at the center of the story, it helps that he's actually there. 
you know, so that, that's something we're beginning we it up. here and ending it in 19. Yeah. yeah. That's where a point you're making. Yeah. And we'll we'll look at the imagery of uh, the white horse and show why I think that is the case. Now, our our good friend Sigva has a different view, and I'm sad that he's not here and and won't be able to be with us when we do chapter six because I think that would be a very interesting discussion. He makes how, it a negative word, yeah, like the other how three. How two scholars look at the same text, look at the same evidence, and draw different conclusions. I'll try to be fair to his position when we, we come there. <laughs> so just for the, and the other view is that the four horsemen are all evil. And, right, and right. And this view has Christ as good, and then the three are evil. Right, okay. right. and I, I, there are reasons why I take that position that are that are drawn out of the text. I think he's coming at it from a larger view and saying that Satan's got to be in here somewhere. You see, and so this is, uh, so it, it would be more the counterfeit of Christ. And uh, I think Billy Graham took that position as well. So it's not, it's not an evil thing. These, these are difficult texts. Well, uh, yeah. The ones that I've looked at were about 50-50, you know, yeah. on both mm -hmm. sides. I don't have as yeah. many as you have, but I've read yeah. some. You know. Yeah, and we'll, when we get to that, we'll, we'll look at sure, the evidence sure, too, sure. because that's a crucial point. What you do with that first horse determines uh, everything. Okay, so just a link is, yeah. you're, tying, you're tying the idea of Christ's enthronement to heaven. Now he begins the unlocking of the seals. Yeah. Here's crown and, and victory where over, right. over and creation and the cross right. and death. And then at the end, it's a victory over Babylon. Right now I'm giving evidence that chapter five is at the beginning of history, not at the end. And, because it starts the seal process. And let me, let me give a real clincher here. Uh, we've looked at chapter 19, but take real a look. Clincher. Yeah, real one. Take a look at chapter six mm -hmm. and verse 10. And here you have the souls under the altar. These, these are martyrs as a result of you know, those who reject the gospel. And he says, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Those who dwell on the earth is, is the opponents of God, hmm. the, the wicked. So what this text is saying, how long will you be not judging and not avenging? Now this is five seals after he takes the book. So well after chapter 5, judgment hasn't started yet. Go back to chapter 19, Revelation 19, and verse 2. And it says, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged, past tense, the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and has avenged, past tense, on mm. her the blood of his servants. What verse was that again? Chapter 19, verse 2. Yeah. So it uses exactly the same language as the fifth seal, but it's now past tense. What hasn't started in the fifth seal is already passed in chapter 19. So that's an indication that even in the fifth seal, the second coming of Jesus seems to be maybe the end of the sixth seal. Even at the fifth seal, final judgment hasn't started. Interesting. But it's clearly over by chapter 19. So this is evidence that in chapter 5, we're not dealing with 1844. We're not dealing with end time, you know, see, but, uh, but piling up evidence that points us in a different direction. So on a really weird side note, when someone said, says to me, he's judging you right now, is that a relevant statement, or is does it, he only judges at one point in time at the end? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's an excellent question. That'll take us the rest of the show okay, if Dan is okay with that. That's a good one. No, it's a good one. <laughs> no, I'm just it's a good curious. one. Uh, and, and I'll give the the thirty thousand foot uh, view. Uh, in the Gospel of John, there are three types of judgment. There's judgment at the cross. Mm -hmm. And judgment at the cross, you know, it says, uh, now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of the world is cast out. When I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw everyone to me. So Jesus at the cross is the judgment of the world. Now how is that possible? If not in the person of Jesus Christ is represented the whole human race. 
Hmm. He went to the cross for us. He rose for us. He lived his life for us. At the cross, the entire human race is being judged in the person of Jesus. So uh, when God looks at us and sees, you know, all the sin, mm -hmm. all the mess the human race has done, that is put on Christ according to the New Testament. Again, there's metaphorical language, but it's put on Christ and God will have nothing to do with sin. So in judgment, hmm. he pulls away. And what does Jesus say? Why have you forsaken. forsaken me? So Jesus recognizes that judgment has occurred. It already started in the Garden of Gethsemane. He would have died there if the angels hadn't rescued him. Hmm. The, the sense of separation from God. But when that same judgment opens the books again on Sunday morning and looks at the perfect life of Jesus, there's no reason to keep him in the grave. Hmm. And he is raised up. Here's the beautiful thing. Whole human race is condemned because of its sin. But in Jesus Christ, the whole human race is raised, representing at the cross. So the gospel is two things. It's telling the truth about yourself, and it's embracing the fact that God accepts you in spite of all that. That's the twofold side. You miss either of those and you have a distorted yeah. gospel. The second judgment in the Gospel of John is whenever the gospel is preached. So when Jesus, in the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus talks, people are being judged. Some accept, some reject. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a division yeah, taking place. Sword. Whenever the gospel mm -hmm. is preached, you're telling people two facts. Number one, you stink, basically. By yourself, in yourself, you are rebellious, you are hopeless, you're, you know, you're not ever going to attain where you want to be. But the gospel also says that in Jesus Christ, you're acceptable to God. <laughs> then the final judgment is simply validating the choices people have made throughout history. Yeah, that yeah, second yeah. judgment, we judge ourselves. Either accept the gospel, both sides of it, or say, no, I don't want to go there. Final judgment is God looking down on the record of our lives and saying, you know, did this person really trust me or did this person choose to live for themselves? We just got a few seconds left. Do you, your, your, your great explanation of the beginning of Christ's enthronement and the end, you know, beginning with the crown, he will avenge, he will, and then mm -hmm. he has. Do you think John envisioned a long time period for that or did he see this is going to start and it's going to roll, and we're going to have this uh, avengement, and it's going to judgment is going to be quickly. Not the impression you get from verse one. People can go back to that original show where we we talked about it, uh, but no, I don't think John sees two thousand years. But uh, God uh, always portrays time as short mm -hmm. for our sakes, because it really is. For you us. know, for your grandpa, mm -hmm. time was short. And as you get older, I think it gets shorter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, and, and God bless you as you travel, thank Sarah. You. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we'll see you when you get back. Mm -hmm. And John, thank you. Great stuff. Great, great, great stuff. Thank you for being with us. This is GPS, Revelation 5. We may have a little more next show, and then we'll go on to the seals. God bless.